Hello, and welcome to Florida Atlantic University's Research Cafe. I'm Jeannie Viviani. I'm the Director of Research Development in the Division of Research, and it's my pleasure to be moderating this panel discussion today. Before we get started, I would like to take a minute to also promote another excellent program called Research in Action. In that series, it prevent, presents the work of one of FAU's faculty researchers to the community at large. This is offered each month through the Division of Research. The next one will be held January 16th with Dr. Samir Hinduja's presentation on your role in com combating cyberbullying. So please mark your calendars. The Research Cafe was developed with a dual purpose. The first is to highlight and showcase faculty research work to the broader campus community, faculty, students, and staff. The second purpose is to facilitate dialogue and collaboration between two very different disciplines. This doesn't mean it always results in collaborations, but from time to time it has sparked new areas of interest and in how the disciplines may intersect. You as an audience may also see some similarities, which leads to the next few points. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our first panelist. Dr. Oscar Corrette is an associate professor in the Department of Ocean and Mechanical Engineering. His research focuses on the fluid dynamics of bio-inspired systems. In particular, he has studied the fluid dynamics of bio-inspired marine propulsion and mangroves. He has awarded the National Science Foundation Career Award to study the modeling and control of underwater vessels with undulating fin propulsion. Dr. Corrette, you're more than welcome to get started. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, having for having me, uh, I'm not sure my screen. We can see it. Okay, perfect. All right, so, uh, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I just want to give you a little bit of overview of my work. I, uh, my area of research is uh, basically the, the full dynamics of bio-inspired system. I, and I really are looking at different things, uh, but mostly I, I focus on marine propulsion. Coastal preservation, looking at mangrove, and um, more recently a swarm, collective swimmers. Uh, and also for this one, I'm just gonna give a little bit of uh, uh, do-it-yourself experiments that I've been doing at home, okay? So uh, these uh, work is uh, mostly uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, well, and here's a, a little bit of the of these flapping foils, you know, so film. But before we start, you know, tell me a little bit to, to, to talk a little bit of my, you know, uh, 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 kind of personal life. So uh, this is uh, Lucas and Dalit, they are my kids. Uh, and uh, they, they like, they li I don't know if you can hear, but they like bombs, you know. So they, they like to, you know, ride bikes and so on. So I want to take a little bit of time just to not only tell tell that, but actually give a little bit of reflection of what I've been doing in the last uh, few months. Uh, many of you uh, probably experienced the same thing. So since March, I really have two labs, you know, one at work and one at home. I'm an experimentalist uh, and I have basically tried to do experiment at home just to keep my uh, kids entertained. So, so I have two labs, two kids, and sometimes what it feel like uh, two full jobs, okay? So uh, before I to my work, I just wanted to give a little bit of reflection of what I've learned the last uh, few months in something with the kids at home and doing work. Uh, so basically, uh, I, first of all, uh, you know, when, I, when, when the pandemic started, I, I really don't know what to do with the kids so they're at home. So I said, well, let's just, I mean, again, I'm experimental. So let's, let's try some experiments. I, you know, a um, few things that I, that I learned, you know, experiments have uh, their own life. So here's uh, my, my son, uh, you know, playing with, with bubbles, but suddenly the experiment changed just, he got a fan and throwing bubbles in there. And you don't know what happened with experiments. So they, they end up, the experiments, you know, cleaning the, the fridge with soap. Uh, the other thing is like, you know, we, we love experiments to actually learn and experience our world. So again, uh, one of the best way to learn the, uh, you know, I, I studied again, fluid mechanics and physics is with experiments. Is my yeah. son uh, kind of learning kind of the uh, conservation of momentum. And also, 
my little son here with a, a little heat engine here, uh, drinking beer, just drinking beer, that water. And yeah, the other thing that we, I, I realized is like, you know, my research is in fluid, uh, fluid dynamics. That's what I do, you know, for a living. Uh, but we all love water. So, you know, kids love water and, and kind of that's what brings me again uh, to, to this research. So, I, you know, I, I, uh, this is what I do for work, but at the same time, it's like a, a, our nature or our, you know, since very kid, we're curious about how fluids behave, how water behaves. And that really brings to my, actually my research that uh, it's, uh, it's a fluid dynamics of our inspired system. I really look at uh, three different areas. So I have one marine propulsion, uh, looking at specific uh, uh, fish. I look at coastal protection using mangrove as a model. And finally, I'm looking at swarm and how different animals, in this case, fish, when they swim, they, they kind of interact hydrodynamically. And again, here's a little video of how we kind of understand that I clearly don't work with, with, uh, with live animals. I'm a mechanical engineer, so I usually do simplify system. In this case, uh, you know, it's just a flapping foil and try to use that as a model to learn more about what might happen in nature, okay? But for this talk, I mean, I'm just gonna be very brave. Uh, I'm just gonna focus on the marine propulsion, okay? That's what I'm gonna be talking. Uh, so first of all, like, uh, you know, it really works in, you know, biomimetics or bioinspired system. Uh, Biomimetics really, uh, it, you know, it again composes two different words: is life, uh, 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 lifelike, and copy. So basically, it's when a robot equipment or a system is designed to imitate uh, uh, elements of nature. Or bioinspired in general is when you have a system that gets some inspiration from nature. Again, and there are many uh, 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 examples, you know, from spiders, sharks, how they fly the gecko so there are many again there are many examples we can see different wind turbines that they use these tubicles so they improve efficiency how the shape of trains have to uh, look at different uh, uh, beaks on the birds to reduce noise uh, adhesive from uh, uh, gecko sea walls from mangrove and different uh, you know flying devices or swimming devices, looking at fish or, or birds, actually looking at ventilation system and termites, how they, how they build their, their termites, how they can improve ventilation. Uh, so to, it's a big field, different areas, in particularly uh, look at marine propulsion. And, you know, of course, these cases, uh, they have a, a, a basic propeller that that's what they use to move. And it's, it's strategically fine for high speed, but one of the challenges that they have is that it's really difficult for station keeping, for doing really fine uh, rabbit maneuver, it's really difficult. So I look at this fish, this is called the knife fish. It's actually very peculiar because they swim with an undulating fin. Uh, and that's kind of my model for, for the system that I'm gonna have. And there are a few, I uh, have a few videos here. This is a knife fish swimming in a flume. So there is water from left to right. And basically highlighting here is the undulating fin. Uh, and now it's interesting because they can swim also forward and backward. So they can actually, this is the fish they like to be in a, in a tube uh, and I can move that tube and he tried to keep, uh, uh, you know, try to keep uh, to be in that tube. And they change the direction. I can change the, uh, uh, the direction of the swimming by just changing how they change the motion of that fin. And so based on that, we have built a, a underwater vessel and here's in motion. So basically have an underwater fin. It's not exactly the same as a fish because it's completely rigid that hull. but we have like an underwater fin and we can modulate that fin and basically get some sort of propulsion. Uh, and that is kind of like an overview of, 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 the, of, the, of, of the, the knife boat itself. You know, we have uh, 16 motors, we have all the electronics inside, batteries, all the electronics. 
It's a two part, you have the cap, we have the bottom part. And basically we can control each of these motors inside and we can undulate the array and the array have a membrane that is the part, the black part in the bottom of the, of the, of the robotic system. And with that undulation, we can change uh, the motion and how it can swim. Uh, so what we do with these, so basically again, we, we do experiments to see how it swim, how we can change the kinematics, but at the same time, we, we develop a, a kind of simplified simulation or models. So we can have some computational experiments or some computational simulation. And also we do experiments in a water tank. Here's a fish swimming now in the, in a, in the lab. And we basically track the points uh, and we can get the speed, how, you know, the, how much energy is consuming and so on. Now, one of the, thing that we are looking right now is like, how do we change the kinematics of the fin to go, to go wherever we want in an efficient way? You know, we have this system now, how you can use it, how you can manipulate those fins uh, to turn, to move up, down, but in an efficient way. And the, the bottom line is like, we, we don't know. We don't know how to do it. Like we, we have a, you know, we have a, a, you know, an idea how to do it, uh, but how is efficient or not. So we don't know, but we can try different things. And that's what we're doing in the lab. So we tried, uh, and there are different ways to improve that looking from uh, uh, animal observation, also for artificial intelligence, uh, and basically a lot of experiments, okay? Uh, and many of the experiments are done at, uh, so I, at SeaTech, the Ocean Engineering have a campus there, the Man Lab is there. So we do labs, uh, experiments in the lab, but also a little bit on the field too. Uh, and it's some of, some of the ex uh, experiments that we have. This is a, the knife, but uh, we have three markers so we can follow this. And right now we are looking from above in a carrier that's moving at the same speed of the, of, of, of the fish. In this case is what we call open loop. We are undulating the fin and let this uh, fish swim. And you can see after some time, it's gonna go to the, to, the, to the side. It's not correcting its direction. It's just gonna move forward. And if deviate, it's just gonna hit the wall at some point. Now, the question is like, how we can, how we can make the fish to know where to go? Like how we can you know, change its kinematics to correct its position. And that's one of the things that we're doing. And we do that with what we call a feedback control. It's like, you know, you know your position, and maybe going in the wrong direction. So I share my kinematics. So now this is, uh, this is a, a quick video here. Now, in this case, there is flow from uh, uh, left to right. So imagine this is like be running a treadmill. Uh, now the interesting part of this is like the fish is actually uh, changing its kinematics based on its position. And it's true that there is some oscillation side to side but if, if there is some oscillation, it changes and it tries to be in the center of that. So uh, in, in the right uh, plot is basically the X, Y position. The actually blue is what is actually moving the center and the red is the actual reference. That's our desired point. And it's true that it's kind of oscillating that point, but it kind of most of the time be around there. Uh, uh, now, the other thing that we do in the lab is just to uh, kind of turn in experiments that is in a, in a, in a shallow pool that we have uh, in the you know, SeaTac. And basically we are trying to do some different turnings. The fish right now is like uh, in a very uh, low speed. And we can basically deviate the fin to some way uh, to basically do some turning. Uh, and what we do is this. So basically we build up uh, some uh, simplified models. So we don't have to necessarily do all things on experiments, but we can recreate the dynamics and the forces on the fin. And basically we can have some recreation of that in a, in a, in a simulation. So basically we can change the kinematics and get, and get an idea how the motion of this uh, uh, fish is going to be. And of course, we're just learning how to kind of 
we kind of seen that we could do some changes. We can do to one way, to other way, but we are still very far if this is optimal or not. And that's what we are trying to learn, you know, how we can change those kinematics. Uh, we are looking at uh, turning like a kind of like camber fashion, these, these fin, so we can uh, uh, achieve a very uh, close radius of curvature. And, uh, and so, I mean, I just think like, I actually took uh, uh, less time than I, that I, that I thought, but, I, but in summary, uh, what I want to tell you that what I've been doing so far at work and at home is that I'm just playing with water. So that is uh, the end and uh, I'll be happy to have some question once uh, this, is, this is over. Thank you, Dr. Corret. that's awesome. We'll uh, hold on to the questions uh, until we have uh, Dr. Tessel. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Dr. Tessel. Um, Dr. Carol Tessel is an assistant professor as well as a speech language pathologist who has worked as a clinician for more than 20 years in both English and Spanish. Her research interests include second language acquisition, phonology in bilingualism, and accent modification. She recently published an article comparing different approaches for accent modification or services provided by speech and language pathologists. So welcome, Dr. Tessel. Hi. Um, all right. So First, I will uh, talk a little bit about myself. Um, I was born in Manhattan. Um, and then, uh, so I have my New York accent. And then um, around middle school, my family moved to South Florida. And then I eventually moved back to Manhattan to get my PhD. Um, and then came back here about six or seven years ago um, to work at FAU. So I'm kind of half South Florida, half um, New York City person um, and definitely an East Coast person. Uh, so a little bit more about myself. Um, when I graduated with my degree in speech pathology, I started working in New York City and um, with children and a lot of my children that I worked with, their parents didn't speak English. And so I said, I really have to have better Spanish skills to be able to communicate with these families. So I went about taking as many Spanish classes as I possibly could, um, listening to every bit of Spanish music I could, watching novelas. And um, before I started my PhD program, I took the whole summer off and went to Costa Rica and to Peru, here's me at Machu Picchu, and just kind of immersed myself in the culture and the language. Um, and when I came back, um, I did take the New York City proficiency exam for Spanish and passed it. And so I worked with children from zero to five um, in both English and Spanish. Um, a little bit more about me. I also um, took a trip to Mexico a few years back and met my soon to be husband. Um, and we eventually produced this um, handsome thing that you see here. And he, if you know the story of Camelot, he decided he wanted to be King Arthur for Halloween this year. So this is him pulling Excalibur out of the sand near our house. Um, and so he is about to turn five on Monday. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, as far as my experience with bilingualism and um, accent modification services, I have at least seven years of experience doing this. Um, as a clinician and also as a supervisor, I supervise graduate students who do this type of treatment. Um, you know, I've been looking into bilingualism, um, you know, since I started um, learning a second language myself. Um, and I recently published this article comparing two different treatments, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And I also have a chapter coming out um, in a textbook on articulation and phonology. So just to start off with, um, you know, what is an accent, right? We all have variations in the way that we speak, kind of what we might call an idiolect or a dialect that's just um, special to that individual. Um, but when we think about accents, we can be talking about 
um, a regional accent or what might be considered a national origin accent, or you may hear it called foreign accent. So a regional accent, that's really something that is um, the same among individuals from a specific geographic location, right? So, you know, me being from Manhattan, I have a very specific way of saying things, right? I say walk, and I think people in Florida say more like walk. Um, very interestingly, my name, I say Carol, and everyone down here says Carol. So um, that's a regional accent, right? But then a national origin accent really is about um, someone, typically someone who was a little older when they learned their second language, kind of how their first language influences the way that they pronounce words in their second language. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, kind of what we know about that, how that happens, and what factors can affect that. Um, so accent modification is something that speech language pathologists do, but you don't have to be a speech language pathologist. There are um, other people who do accent modification, and certainly um, people who have degrees in linguistics also do this, you know, ESL teachers and things like that, um, may do some level of um, phonological or, or sound um, instruction. So non-native speakers of English may look into this, um, even speakers who want to reduce a specific uh, regional accent. Um, oftentimes we'll see it's kind of business or medical professionals that have moved here from another country that want to be able to communicate um, with more ease, want to be understood better. Um, and even sometimes actors who have to take on a specific role may seek out um, this kind of service. Um, so why? Typically, it's because they are having difficulty being understood. Um, it's affecting maybe their confidence in their job or just communicating in their neighborhoods. Um, you know, I know we had a client that came in, she was from Spain, and she had a really hard time communicating down here in English that she felt, you know, she had a teenage daughter and she would make her daughter come with her everywhere. And she really didn't like that. She wanted to feel more confident um, in how she spoke. So some of the things that clients have said to us are, you know, I'm embarrassed to speak in public. People don't understand me. Um, I have to ask my daughter to speak for me. Um, so just a note on terminology, right? I, I've gotten into the habit of saying accent modification. That's what we call this service. But I think it's continually changing the terminology. Um, I've heard most recently, I went to, um, you know, a continuing education event just this week where they're saying um, the best term is accent management. Um, but I know a few people who've received this service that, that find that, that term offensive, you know, saying that I'm managing their accent. So um, maybe we should just say pronunciation training. I think um, this is kind of still a work in progress. Um, now, what do we call these sound differences? So I think in the past, we often said, well, these second language learners, they're making errors in English. But, but that's really not true. What it is, is a transfer, right? They're taking some aspect of their first language and transferring it into their speech of their second language. Um, and so I prefer um, something like phonological transfer or a cross-linguistic pattern, transfer pattern. Um, or in general, just um, first language influence, right? And I think using, using terms like errors, I think is really people are becoming more and more aware of not using things like what we call deficit language, right? And something like the word error would, would really be that. Okay, so just really quick, what are we measuring in these types of studies or in this type of treatment? Well, we're measuring accentedness is one thing, and that's really just the listener's perception of how different is this person's speech from the speech of my community. Um, and then intelligibility is how well are they understood? How much can I understand of what they're saying? And then third is comprehensibility, and that is really how easily are they understood, right? Or how much effort does the listener have to put into understanding what they're saying? Right, and these three things are not necessarily all um, always graded the same, right? A person may have a very high level of accentedness, but be very easy to understand, right? Because they may make other adjustments to their speech, right? Like they may speak slower or use more pauses um, and things like that. 
And what are some of the factors that affect the degree of foreign accent? Um, so the biggest one is what we call AOA, and that's age of acquisition. So how old was this person when they started learning their second language, right? So I'm sure, you know, you've heard that um, around puberty, right? Around 12, 13 years old is, is often the cutoff for where most people will end up having a foreign accent, even if they're very, very high functioning in their second language. Um, but actually, it, it's more of a sensitive period where it can happen at any age. And even people who learn languages older than 13 or 14 years old um, may end up without um, an accent or a very mild accent. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, more about that on the next slide. Um, length of residence is another factor. So how long has that person now been immersed in the community that speaks their second language? Um, and this tends to be important in the first couple of years that a person is immersed, but after a couple of years, it doesn't tend to have that much of an effect. Um, and then amount of first and second language usage, right? So for example, have you moved to a new country, but then you're still going home every night and speaking your first language with your family? You might have the opportunity to speak your first language at work too. Um, and therefore you're not getting as much practice as someone who is um, maybe living with people who also speak their second language. Um, the relationship between the first and second language. So how closely related are they linguistically and structurally? Um, your individual motivation, right? So why are you learning this second language? Do you, do you have to have this language to um, be successful in your business or um, in your schooling? Um, or are you just maybe learning it for fun? <laughs> um, and you know, what kind of personality do you have? What kind of opportunities are you generating for yourself? Are you, you know, going out of your way to take as many opportunities as you can to speak this second language? So these are all things that come into account. Um, and so this is what we call the sensitive period. It's like this weird Z graph. Um, and this is just kind of a mock-up of what, what it kind of is. Obviously, there's a lot of individual variation, but Starting between about four and seven years of age that a person learns their second language, we do start to see people have production patterns that are different than a native speaker's. Okay, and so just to give an example of this idea of transfer, right, and how the relationship between the L1 and the L2 or first and second language can change the way people produce their second language. Um, as an example, Spanish has five vowels, right? So they have only five specific single vowels um, in their phonological system, whereas English has about 12, maybe more or less, depending on your dialect of English. Um, so what happens is, um, and let me orient you to these pictures. So um, if you look up in the um, upper left-hand corner of each one, you'll see that I, um, that stands for the sound E as in beat. And what these represent is where your tongue is in the mouth when you say these sounds. So when you say E, your tongue is very far forward and very high in your mouth. So all if you go down, further down on the graph, it would be a sound where your tongue would be further down um, in your mouth. So just looking at these graphs, you can see that English and Spanish both have that E sound. But then right below that E is this capital I symbol, and that stands for the I in English, right? So in English, we'd have the word beat, but we also have the word bit, right? And those are what we call minimal pairs, where they only differ by one sound. And someone coming from a Spanish-speaking background or also um, a Japanese-speaking background or a Russian-speaking background, where they have many fewer vowels than us, they're going to have trouble distinguishing those vowels, at least initially. Um, and they might have difficulty producing that it vowel, right? Because it might get what we call assimilated into their E vowel category. Um, and then also, as far as the differences between the languages, we have differences in what we call our phonotactic systems. And that really has to do with the structure of when sounds can be placed in a syllable, in a word, can, can certain sounds not be next to each other in a word? And every language has different rules, right? So just a few examples in English. 
Um, we have word initial, word medial, and word final consonant clusters, meaning two or three consonants that can happen together, right? Um, so for example, here you see this ST cluster can happen at the beginning, in the middle, or at the end of a word. Um, however, um, languages like Japanese or like Vietnamese, they really don't have these clusters. So when a person is a second language learner from these backgrounds, they have a really hard time producing these clusters. Um, in English, we don't allow two stop consonants um, to occur in, initial, in an initial cluster, right? Um, for example, stop consonants are things like B, P, T, and D. Um, but a cluster like P, T together can happen at the beginning of a word in languages like Greek or Polish. Um, in English, it can happen at the end of a word, right? Like the word kept, but it can't happen at the beginning of a word. Um, in English, we have S clusters um, at the beginning of a word, like that ST cluster, but in Spanish, it can't. It has to have a vowel before it, right? Okay, so why is this important? Well, these transfer patterns can change the meaning of a word, right? So for example, if a person had trouble producing final consonants in English, the word time might sound like the word tie. So that changes the meaning. If a person had difficulty producing the a ah sound in English, the word battle might sound like the word bottle. Um, if they had trouble saying that it sound, the word ship might sound like the word sheep. Um, if they had trouble saying that sh the sh sound in English, which is often difficult for um, native Spanish speakers, they might produce it or hear it as cheap. Okay, so there was a variety of treatment protocols for accent modification. I'm only today gonna talk about articulation and phonology. Um, so phonology, basically this is what we call a contrast approach. So you take the target and the way the person is producing it and you show them the contrast, right? And you show them the meaning difference. Um, and, and that is you know, supposed to help produce change in their production patterns, right? So for example, if somebody had trouble saying the TH sound in English, they were saying that as dat, right? We would show them the differences and how those two are produced differently. Um, and this is used with children to these approaches. So for example, you may have heard a lot of little kids saying wabbit instead of rabbit. And so bringing that to their attention. Um, for what we call articulation approaches, you may, this is what's often used with maybe someone that has a lisp or something like that, um, we would teach the client specifically where to put what we call your articulators, right? Or like your lips, your teeth, your tongue, right? To lift the tongue further forward or further back or further down in the mouth. Um, so for example, a phonological approach, we would start at the word level. We would give examples of those minimal pairs, right? Or words that differ just by the sound that's problematic. The client might be shown the target word contrasted with their production. We would explain those differences and then we would practice through imitation, right? So um, the, the clinician would, would produce it or possibly we, we could use you know, some kind of audio program. Um, and this is just an example like pig versus fig, right? And um, this is a contrast that's hard for some Vietnamese speakers, for example. Um, so this study that we completed, um, we had clients come in for seven different weeks and we had one group doing more of this articulation based approach and one doing more of a phonological based approach. Um, in the phonological based approach, we used those minimal pairs, we used flashcards, we used things like bingo that we played with the group. Um, and these were all second language learners. Um, that were native Spanish speakers and they were all adults and all females. Um, and we used kind of prosody, just kind of um, accentuating different parts of the word to bring attention to them. Um, and basically what was found was that the articulation or motor-based approach was better at um, addressing vowels. And so what do we wanna do next? Well. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about a study that we were supposed to start this year, but due to COVID, it's pretty much on hold until we can figure out how to do it virtually. Um, 
And then I'm also going to talk about another idea that, that we're looking into but um, haven't done yet. So our proposed study was that we wanted to um, expose a client to a short story involving neighbors of the target sound in a word, right? And, I, and I'll show on the next slide. So for example, if the difficulty is the word, is the sound TH, um, we may choose the word that to address it. And then we would have them listen to short stories with words that were very close to the word that, so neighbors, right? Um, and we would take recordings before or after treatment. So they'd listen to the story, have some treatment um, for a certain amount of weeks, um, and then we'd record them before and after and see um, how well they were doing with producing that specific target sound. Um, and this procedure was shown to be effective with children that had difficulty producing the L, R, or S. Um, so as an example, this would be for that that target. Um, they would listen to a story that had all these neighboring words, these minimal pairs like fat, cat, mat, bat, um, before treatment, um, and then have some kind of probably motor phonologically based a treatment afterwards. Um, and this would be if we were targeting, for example, um, the word, the sound V, right? So like in the word veil, and then we would have all of these within the short story, these kind of neighboring words. Um, and then hopefully um, this kind of what we call auditory bombardment or auditory priming before the treatment um, would help them to gain this sound in their repertoire. Um, and then another thing that we want to look at is, is listeners, you know, should, maybe we should just be training the listeners, right? The speaker isn't really the problem um, because having an accent is, is amazing. And it, and it kind of is part of your identity. I know for me, I've, I'm at this point have very much embraced the fact that when I speak Spanish, you know, I know I'm not a native Spanish speaker and everybody else knows it too. Um, and, and that's okay. Right. Um, so what's the research evidence? behind training listeners? Well, they have found that perceptual accuracy does increase with exposure to an accent. So the more you're exposed to it, the better you are at understanding. Um, there's also been studies on the fact that um, people adapt to foreign accent pretty rapidly, right? So maybe the first few sentences someone says, you may have to take more effort to understand them, but month, once you've listened to them quite a bit, um, you can understand them. Um, and then also an interesting finding has been that a non-native clinician speech might actually be more intelligible to someone who's not a native speaker than a native speaker would be. So people with accents understand other people with accents better, even if they don't have the same language background. Um, so one study um, that was previously done with, they actually did the study with social work students they gave half of the group um, just cross-cultural training in general, and another half of the group um, accent training specifically. And what they found that neither became, um, neither was significantly different in understanding accents better, but they did both show more empathy um, towards immigrants and the immigrant population, which was, which is another part of it, right? Um, and then a more recent study that came out this year said, um, they feel it's likely that um, training listeners using things like watching TV with subtitles, watching videos with the subtitles there may help, and also simply having exposure to multiple speakers, right? Um, and that's something that helps children learn language too, is being exposed to multiple speakers. So hearing multiple examples of different words and hearing multiple examples of different consonants and vowels being produced. Okay, and that's it for me. Thank you. There was a lot of citations too. <laughs> we can go through the citations another time because I've got lots of questions here for, for both of you. And I really appreciate um, you both taking the time out. I know this is a busy time of year, especially just before the holidays with exams coming up and everything else. So we really do appreciate your time uh, coming in and giving this talk. Um, First of all, let me also say that kudos to both of you, and I think this goes to a lot of faculty in general who have to do the whole um, work-life balance thing and uh, what you do with uh, kids. And uh, nice to see that um, 
Oscar and, and Carol, both of your children, all, all of your children are, are looking happy and healthy and doing well. And so that's good. So that's a wonderful thing. Um, so I'm going to direct uh, my first question to Oscar. Um, and so, and then I have a couple other ones for, for Carol. And, and please, uh, our, our guests in the audience, please feel free to use the Q&A button to ask some questions and I'll be happy to field those as well. But uh, for Oscar, one of the questions uh, that I have for you is, is the uh, is the is the submersible is it a submersible or is it actually on the surface of the water? I couldn't tell whether or not that some of the technology that you're working on is it is it for is it going to be designed for both? And also, what are the type of materials that you're using for the fin? Yeah. So actually, the um, the the vessel itself is the purpose is so to be a submersible, so mm -hmm. to actually be able to go underwater uh, right now we are in the we are going through a different uh, let's say uh, design process and uh, iterations uh, this first iteration uh, we do not have what is called like a, a like a variable ballast basically where you can change the buoyancy of the vessel to to control that so it's it's completely if, if we don't actually if we don't undulate the fin uh, the, the, the vessel is going to go down. So it's a little bit more denser than the water. So it's going to go down. Now, this fin uh, generally forces in different direction, and one is in the vertical direction. So when, when we start unlayering the fin, the, the vessel is going to go to the top. Uh, now, uh, for the experiments that we want, I mean, the, the, the first iteration, it, we're more interested in doing maneuvers in one plane. So we didn't we're looking too much into control the depth. Uh, so we were looking at just like kind of plane and turning. So for us, it was fine to be uh, most of the time on the surface. Now for the second iteration that we have, uh, we, uh, we are gonna have like a variable ballast and we are gonna control depth as well. So that's part of it. And, and I, yeah, actually we do have some experiments I didn't show it here. That is where we are controlling the, the, the position in depth only with the fin. One of the one of the part that, that one of the problems that we have or challenges is like uh, there's a lot of coupling between the forces that we get in the fin. So mm -hmm. if we want to control depth, then we cannot control speed or, or there's some sort of, of uh, coupling between these forces. So it's kind of tricky. Uh, but but yes, we 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 are you know the 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 kind of end goal is to control the six degrees of freedom. So basically be able to swim as a fish, right? That, that's what we want. I mean, it's gonna take some time. So uh, now regarding the theme, that, that's another quick question. Like we, we actually, right now we are using like a, like a fabric, it's like a, it's a Lycra. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's very, you know, we can, we can expand it, but not too much. That's something that we should, I mean, there are some, a lot of room for improvement. There are a lot of different materials that we can use there. Uh, I would be happy to maybe collaborate with some people that works more in the material side or know more about material. We try a few things, but many cases didn't work very well. Uh, so we end up doing just uh, Lycra. And it's really like we, <laughs> it's funny because we have, I mean, we, we we have my grass suit and we bought like a sewing machine and we were sewing. And <laughs> so we kind of have like a little glove really like uh, we have all these rays that are kind of uh, more rigid and uh, we create little uh, like, like, you know, compartments sewing and we put these on the ray and that's how we put it on the fin. Actually we're really fine. So I've been working, I don't know, you know, three years or so and you have no break so far. So, uh, but we can definitely look at different type of materials. So you, you had the engineers doing sewing? Is that what they were doing too? Yes, yes, we have, they're doing sewing. You know, it's interesting, you know, when you start to build in something- when they give up home ec in high schools, you know? <laughs> you, you have to do a few things that you, you thought you were not gonna be doing, but. <laughs> There's a couple of questions that came in on the Q&A. Um, uh, Maria Vasquez, she said, Oscar, great overview of the use and applications in mimicry. Wondering if you had the opportunity to share your research with a younger audience and a non-technical audience, and what do you normally share with them? Yeah, uh, 
Um, so yeah, I mean, for for a younger audience, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. So so actually, I I actually I have like a I did uh, one one model for a bio propulsion with a with a FAU high school. I, I give like one lecture there. Uh, we also have in at CTEC, I mean, when we, when there were uh, uh, summer camps, we, we host a summer camp at CTEC and we give like a lecture, uh, not really lecture, more like a, like a demo. Like we, we do some sort of demos and uh, show them, you know, the robot and how what we can do kind of inspire. So uh, I, uh, you know, I, at the end, I mean, if, if, the, if, if, if the young kids are interested, you know, I, I like to do that because, you know, if they're interested, you know, most likely adults are going to be interested too, right? So, right. So, uh, so I usually, I don't mean in this case, for example, I didn't go into details. You know, I, I, I really want, I, what I shared today was more like an overview, what, what our motivation, uh, and that's what I share with them, you know, what's, what's, what's motivate us while we are doing this work. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Okay. Hopefully, we get some kids are inspired in STEM field as well. And, you know, we get some more uh, uh, diverse uh, 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 researchers in, in, in science and engineering. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Vasquez, for that question. Uh, Regina Thompson is asking two questions, one for Dr. Curret and one for Dr. Tessel. Um, for Dr. Corette, uh, what would you, where would, where could this biomimicry underwater device be used, assuming you reach your goal of it swimming like a fish? And then for Dr. Tessel, what platform app method would you recommend for learning a second language as an adult? So while Dr. Tessel's thinking about that one, uh, Dr. Corette, if you want to answer the first one of, about where you might uh, use um, some of this device, other than maybe military applications. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, there are uh, one of the things that we uh, maybe I didn't I didn't go into much detail. Like one of the problems in current vessels is if you want to have these steady, like in one position, uh, your propellers are really bad doing that. Like the propellers are not good to station keeping. So if you want to do, uh, 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 if you want to survey an area, you want to uh, uh, kind of get really inspection of an area that is that is complex, that is difficult. If you want to go uh, close to a, maybe like a reef or an or, or, or ocean structure, you first of all, you don't want to have a propeller close by because it can damage that, that, mm -hmm. that area. So you, if you are, uh, you know, so, so you want to inspect something that have uh, some sort of, you don't want to damage. Uh, so, so some of application, it could be, for example, uh, in inspecting uh, pipelines. You know, there is a lot of inspection of uh, oil gas that they want to inspect pipelines. They don't want to have any AUV close by because they can actually damage the pipeline. Uh, so it's very difficult. So how you do that? So you want to have a propeller that is flexible in some way that if it hits something, doesn't break it. Uh, but also you can be very steady, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, in inspecting, uh, and, uh, you know, at some point, of course, you know, long monitoring of, of you want to uh, monitor large areas. So you want to have something that is small. So we are look, focusing more on something that, that is small, that you can have many of them. Uh, and, uh, you know, water, you know, the ocean is very big, right? <laughs> so if we have many of them, it could help us to understand what about, about uh, uh, you know, you know, the, the condition of the water, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, so. Excellent. Thank you very much. Dr. Tessel, the, other, the question for you is what platform app application or method would you recommend for learning a second language as an adult? There we so, go. Um, uh, I, <laughs> I think you have to be immersed in it to some extent. So I mean, like I sometimes play on my phone with Duolingo, um, you know, because I took like one Portuguese class and I'm still trying to teach myself Portuguese because I have a bunch of neighbors um, that speak Portuguese. And I feel like um, if I get back into more clinical work, you know, I'll probably work with children who are bilingual um, in Portuguese. But I think, you know, you really have to be immersed. So like I 
you know, I took a year of Hebrew in college and I can't speak any Hebrew at all. So those classes were not meant to actually make me conversational. Um, I took Spanish courses at Instituto Cervantes, which is, you know, a language institute, um, an adult language institute. And I got a lot of conversational practice. Um, after I got back from spending the whole summer in Costa Rica and Peru, I went to a private Spanish um, like tutoring company and I got accent modification in Spanish. Um, and then I joined their book club. So it was like even more meaningful. So I started reading novels in Spanish and then going to a book club where I talked about that novel in Spanish. So mm -hmm. I think it has to be meaningful and it ha has to be practiced. Um, you know, I don't have experience with any of these like Rosetta Stone or anything. I've never used those. So I really can't speak to whether they work, but maybe as a basis, a foundation for a language. And then you'd have to find a way to practice. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, a lot more questions just came in um, for Dr. Tessel. Teasing about certain about accent is considered verbal and emotional abuse. How would you how would you like to change the attitude of both the victim and the teaser? Yeah, so I think that goes into what I was talking about with um, listener training that, you know, it wouldn't be only that we would do things like subtitles and different um, different speaker exposure, but also cultural sensitivity training, right? And, you know, I know, I don't know if it was ever published, but there was a study done that was presented at a recent conference where they looked even at speech language pathologists have biases against people who that have an accent. So I think cultural sensitivity training is very important, you know, across the board, um, especially in academia, which is such an international profession. Um, I feel like that would be really, really important. And, you know, as far as the speaker, I mean, I think, you know, that's, it's very individualized. I know when I started speaking Spanish in public, I was very shy um, and very nervous about my accent. And then at one point I just said, if I don't practice, I'm never going to get this down. Right. right. And, mm -hmm. and I did it and I spent years working with um, native Spanish speakers and their children. And I never had someone complain about my accent. I mean, that I know of because they were happy to have someone there helping their child. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot, you know, needs to be done about just in general, pe people being more sensitive and having bilingualism of any type, right? So not having these specific language biases be mm -hmm. respected, right? Because um, right. there are certain, you know, there's a language hierarchy. There are some languages that are looked at better than others. And so I think as a country, collectively, the culture kind of needs to change. Great, thank you for that. Um, there, an anonymous attendee did put um, a little note here regarding Mango Connect via FAU Library. So as people who want to learn a second language also have access to a database within our uh, FAU libraries. Uh, I would imagine if you can go to libraries and then look up Mango Languages, you should be able to, to find that. So thank you for offering that um, uh, participant. Um, okay, uh, there's another question too. I think we have time for, for just this one more question. Uh, Dr. Vasquez uh, is saying, Carol, I enjoyed your presentation on accent, especially on the training of listeners. Have you found any relevant literature on accent and listeners training in higher education? Uh, example being accents and listeners uh, training in HSIs. No, I mean, the, the, the most relevant one I found was that one that I spoke about and that was with social work students. Um, but this is kind of something I'm more recently getting into. Um, you know, because I am in this accent field, but my interest was more in phonology and production. Mm -hmm. um, but given COVID, I can't really do as much mm -hmm. in-person work. Right. So m me, myself and my co-author that I did the previous study with are both really interested in listener training. So this is something I'm kind of getting into now um, because I think it's something that we could more easily do virtually. Um, so I'm still not, um, haven't taken in everything in the literature that's out there, but that that was the one that I found that I thought was most um, you know, interesting for this population mm -hmm. for academia. Excellent, excellent. Well, we're uh, right at time. Um, we really do appreciate both of you all sharing your research with the community. Um, and if there are any other questions that come up, could we just shoot them your way? Sure. Great, excellent. Uh, and that wraps up this uh, research cafe.
Thank you all for attending. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye-bye.